Hi everyone, I'm Kyle C. Sullivan. Welcome to Black Pants Film School. This is our VFX breakdown series. Uh, you may have seen our first one where I kind of cover how to do basic green screening and we will go over the effects from D&D The Tavern. For the rest of these videos, I'm basically going to pick a topic for each episode and we're going to go back into old sketches and just break down all of the visual effects that we did in those that relate to that topic. This week's topic is compositing, which um, is a little bit misleading because it's a really wide, all-encompassing topic. Basically, it just means taking a whole bunch of different video and image elements and combining them into one final shot. So we'll see a whole bunch of other visual effects kind of happening at the same time in all of these examples, but the part that I'm focusing on is the compositing, is taking multiple different pieces of footage that maybe you shot in different places and at different times, some green screen elements, some stock footage that you downloaded on the internet, and then sticking them all together and making it look like that's the shot, you know, that's that's what you originally got on the camera. D&D The Tavern is one of my favorite examples of our compositing VFX, but we covered that last time, so if you haven't seen that video, be sure to go check that out. Let's just start real basic. A lot of times we use compositing tricks just to tweak reality just a little bit in ways that could possibly have even happened while we were on set. Things like what I mentioned last time with just removing props or equipment that are in shot that we don't actually want to be there, or duplicating props that we can't afford multiple copies of, but I've also used compositing tricks to uh, enhance reality at times. The best example of this is in our first Superhero Cops video, A Civil Warning. This is the one where our cop characters Kurt and Walt confront Black Widow about her unpaid parking fines. What she does is uh, grabs one of their notebooks and then she flings it at the other one and it kind of hits him in the throat and he falls over. It looks really convincing, but she didn't actually do that on set. You can see here in the original footage that she does the kick and then she takes the notebook, throws it, and it kind of flies in that general direction but uh, then Ian just reacts and falls over. It would have been very difficult to have Allison actually perfectly throw that notebook at Ian's neck. So instead we just did a really simple compositing trick, which is we took this original footage, we removed a few frames from its trajectory where it actually passes by Ian. I then took a copy of the original footage and I rotoscoped out the notebook during those frames. So now I have the base footage with this one section where the notebook disappears. I can take that notebook element and I can readjust it frame by by frame into the exact trajectory that I want. Looks completely realistic, it's all just about timing and sort of mimicking the movement and what the physics might look like. The reason that worked is because I was compositing a piece of footage over itself, so there was nothing to match at all. For a much bigger, more detailed example, let's take a look at the SCP video that we filmed for Halloween a couple years ago. In the last shot, we back out and we show this whole room. It's a weird room, it doesn't exist, we didn't have that room in real life or any of the stuff that was supposed to go in it, so instead I took several shots of our apartment living room and I chopped them up and built a fake room out of it. It's not one of my best compositing jobs, I think I could do a much better job now if I spent more time on it. The first step is is that the base room I wanted to just be an empty box and our apartment was mostly that but on one side we have this bar in the the area that leads into the kitchen and I think there's like a desk over there component parts consist of the empty corner of the room that same corner of the room flipped and then a shot of me in my chair and Ian in his I made sure the lighting was about as flat as possible and stayed consistent as we got each one of these shots so that when I combined them together there wasn't any mismatch in shadows or highlights or anything that gave away the fact that some of the was flipped. The iffy part of it is the chunk of wall and door sitting in the middle of the room. What we did for this is just get a shot of our front door, the one we had been using earlier in the video, and then I cut around it and just sort of plopped it right there in the middle of the shot. We did the best that we could, but because of the space we had to actually get the shot of the door, we couldn't physically place the lights in the same relative positions as they would be if the door was in the room. So the light's a little bit hot on that wall and it's not exactly in the right Right place. There's also the fact that it's supposed to look like it's on this like chunk of wall. I think I just got like pictures of busted up concrete and sort of put it around the edge just to make it look like there was some chunkiness to it. In the end, the shot is completely functional. It gets the punchline across. It, it totally works. Uh, it just doesn't look real. If we were able to take the time to match the lighting a little bit more closely on the different elements of the shot, they would have just combined a whole lot better. And maybe some 3D work would have helped enhance it, but it is 
legitimately mostly lighting. I would actually say probably about 80% of compositing things together successfully is, is color and lighting. Like that makes a huge difference no matter how badly rendered your CGI monster is. If the lighting matches the actual scene, it will look like it's there. Actually on that note, we have a couple examples of compositing some kind of creature or character into an existing shot. One video we put out called The Stuffing of Legends actually was supposed to be an animated video years ago. I found the script and I was like, wow, if I could just get a bear, then I could make this in live action. A normal person would be like, well, but, you know, don't have a bear, so can't do that. But instead, I was like, I bet I could VFX in a bear. This turned out remarkably better than it should have for the complete lack of planning I did. We have this base shot of me running through the grass in very harsh directional sunlight, which means any footage I got would need to match that to look realistic. I just run forward and then I fall over, and that's all I had to work with. So I went on to videoblocks.com, which is the stock footage website that I use, and then eventually found this one one handheld shot of a bear running roughly in the direction I needed it to run with a uh, light that kind of matched. Really just pure luck. If I hadn't found that shot, it would not have turned out nearly as well. And as far as I remember, I didn't have a backup, so the video just wouldn't have worked. I actually stabilized the footage around the bear, cut the bear out frame by frame, animated the bear moving from right to left in the direction that it was running. I timed it so that it hit me at about the moment that I fell over. I used some really simple, cheap masking to sort of make it look like it was blending into the grass. And it just, it just, it, and it's fine. It looks, it looks pretty decent, actually. It shouldn't. I don't know why it turned out that well. Actually, no, I do know why it turned out that well. The lighting matches. I just got really lucky, and it looks like the bear could be standing in that shot because the sun in the bear shot was in roughly the same position as the sun in my shot. In a completely different kind of example, we also had to create a heartless for our Keyblade video. This is something that would traditionally be done with CGI. I had no idea how to do that at the time. So we had to get creative, and as usual, it created a horrible abomination that I'm pretty proud of. The things are called shadows anyway, so I thought I just take a little bit of artistic liberty with it, because if I could turn whatever elements I had into a silhouette, then I didn't have to match the lighting or any of the stuff that I've been talking about this entire time. That meant I really just needed the, the you know, the outline of the character, so I could also record it in pieces and then combine them in post. One chunk of the Heartless is just me in my Spider-Man costume, because it's skin tight, I could just sort of like lean down in front of the green screen and wiggle my arms around, and then the head, it just needed to be a circle with some antenna coming off of it. Since it was around Halloween at the time, we went out, we got uh, like a pumpkin, uh, you know, container that you get candy in. And then the key thing here was making sure that I could add the eyes and realistically, you know, track their movement. So what I came up with was just painting a couple of ping pong balls green and then gluing them onto the bucket. That way I could just get the footage with the eyes already on there. And then in post, I could isolate those eyes and then turn them into whatever I wanted, which is just glowing yellow circles. And then I grabbed some smoke stock footage that I bought from videocopilot.com like 10 years ago. And voila! Voila, you got a Heartless. Now let's move on over to a flashier example of compositing with Theological Combat, our video about Civ religions. There were a whole lot of VFX going on in this one, including giant lasers. Those are actually just a plugin that you can download from videocopilot.com called Saber. The compositing aspect of this video, though, were these shots in particular where they change outfits. It looks really cool, but it was actually really easy to pull off. We basically just got two shots of each person, one in their regular clothes, standing in a specific spot and doing the full motion, and then specifically with without having them move from the spot at which they were standing, we brought their robe over, put it on them, and then had them do the exact same motion again. I then just animated a mask by hand just to follow their movements so that the robe was revealed as their hands came apart. And then I added a glow to that layer to sort of hide the edge a little bit and to distract from the fact that their movements were not like 100% matched up. Finally, let's take a look at Self-Fulfilling Idiocy 4, which was the finale video of the first year of weekly videos that we ever did. We have a whole series of shots where where we have us like running back through our old videos and we had to figure out how to realistically stick ourselves into that those old shots even though we had gotten them like months beforehand. There were a few where we couldn't really go back and revisit the original location, and so we just had to try our best to match the lighting in front of a green screen. But the ones that really turned out well were the ones that we had access to the original locations for. The shot of us running past Sim JP was particularly easy because it was just in my house, no lights, just windows. Same with the Gary the Misanthrope one, which is outside, so it's just sunlight. The one from Minecraft is Intense was particularly great because I still had the original After Effects compositions from that video, which meant I could take the new footage of 
of Jeffrey and Rodriguez running by in the background and actually place it behind the fire and all the visual effects that were happening in the foreground. That's going to be it for today's video. Next week we'll be doing another one. Don't know which one yet. And if you're watching this right now, that means we finally got our first sponsor. Take it away, me. Thanks, me. That's right, we do have a sponsor. Can you guess who it is? I'll give you a hint. It's the sponsor of literally everything ever invented. Audible has an indefinitely massive selection of audiobooks, all available with a monthly subscription, and you can get a free month on us. Just go to Audible Trial slash door and you will not only get to start your 30 day free trial, but you'll also get one free audiobook. I'm sure most of you have already read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but have you had it read to you by Stephen Fry? because that's the only way it gets better, and you can do that on Audible. Plus, just by signing up for the free trial, you help us here at Doormonster get to make more of these videos. So go to audibletrial.com slash door today and get your free audiobook. And thank you to Audible for sponsoring this episode. We'll be back next week with a sketch, so we'll see you then. There's a, that's a loud plane.